The legendary Boston Celtic team of 2008 was a tough, ambitious, and very talented squad. Led by three Hall of Famers in Kevin Garnett, Paul Pierce, and Ray Allen, it begs the question as to how this team almost got upset by an 8 seed team in the first round. And the Celtic losing streak continues. Coming off one of the worst records in franchise history for the Boston Celtics, at 24 and 58, a frustrated Paul Pierce made it well known to the Celtics organization that if they don't go out and add key players to the roster, he would request a trade. And Boston would waste no time in getting Pierce help, as on June 28, 2007, the Celtics packaged a bunch of players, including Jeff Green, Wally Zerbiak, Delonte West, and a second rounder to the Supersonics for Ray Allen and Glenn Davis. And they weren't done there. Fast forward a month later, the Celtics packaged Ryan Gomes, Gerald Green, Al Jefferson, Theo Ratliff, Sebastian Telfair, and two future first round draft picks to the Timberwolves for Kevin Garnett. Just in two months, Boston nearly traded their entire roster for two players, but it was well worth it as they sprung from the bottom of the league to now projected heavy favorites to win the NBA championship. And we also can't forget about Rajon Rondo and Kendrick Perkins. Rondo being the defender and playmaker that he is, would eventually play into the starting lineup throughout the season, while Perkins would start at center and display his fierce defensive interior presence. The Atlanta Hawks on the other hand, up to the 06-07 season, had not reached the playoffs in 8 years. Leading the team was Joe Johnson, who notched his first All-Star appearance the season prior and was blossoming as the team's go-to guy. Johnson gets it to Joe Johnson. JJ rises up and drains the shot at the buzzer. The Atlanta Hawks steal one here at home. Alongside him was the agile Josh Smith, who was a block machine averaging just under three blocks in the last two seasons. A small forward was a very young and promising player out of UNC in Marvin Williams. They also positioned the newly drafted Al Horford at center, and to round it all out, they had the vet in Anthony Johnson at point guard. In regards to the offseason acquisitions, the Hawks never made any significant moves as the team was in clear rebuilding mode. Fast forward now to the halfway mark of the season. With the three star players making it into the All Star game, the Celtics would still go out and add a couple veteran pieces in Sam Cassell and PJ Brown, and they would prove to be vital. On the other hand, sitting at 9th in the Eastern Conference at the time, the Hawks would go out and add Mike Bibby from the Kings to help increase their playoff chances. And they would make good on that playoff push, as the Hawks would finish 8th at 37-45, and 45, just narrowly beating the Pacers by one win. The Celtics would go on to finish with a league best record of 66 and 18 and break the record for the best single season turnaround in NBA history. With the regular season now concluded, the playoffs were now ready to begin. With some exciting matchups around the league in the first round, the Celtics and Hawks matchup wasn't exactly one to be thrilled about. In the regular season, the Celtics won all three matchups and all were decided by 10 points or more. So safe to say all bets on the Celtics, right? Well, not exactly. Game 1 showcased Boston's relentless defense as they shut down the Hawks by holding them to just 38% from the floor. They also put on display their well-balanced offense, having 4 of the 5 starters score at least 15 points. With lackluster offense at subpar defense, the Hawks lost Game 1 of the series 104-81. But aside from all that, it would be Mike Bibby to headline the papers that evening as he called out the Celtics fans after Game 1. He basically called them a bunch of bandwagon fans and he remembered how last year, how they had bags over their heads. But surprisingly, Celtics fans let that slide and some actually even agreed with him. Yeah, that never happened. Cause in Game 2, the Celtics fans absolutely torched Bibby with booze from the opening introductions to every time he touched the ball. And like his teammates, he would not fare well, as for the second straight game, the Hawks would shoot 38%. Paul Pierce would leave the game with a sprained lower back after colliding with Josh Smith in the first quarter, but he would eventually return. 
The Hawks came out attacking from the jump, but much was the same as the Celtics won by 19 points, pushing the series to 2-0 in favor of Boston. And what seemed to be in the bag for the Celtics? This is when things get pretty interesting. Atlanta's atmosphere was totally, totally different from what we expected. You know, we knew they have a crowd, but we didn't know they was gonna have a crowd. As a fired up Atlanta crowd would help set the tone in game three. Up-tempo style of play, effective fast break, would be some of the things the Hawks would catch the Celtics off guard with. Atlanta would tally up a whopping 28 assists, while Josh Smith dropped 27 points and Joe Johnson dropped 23. The difference maker was the third quarter, as the Hawks scored 28 compared to the Celtics 18. Other than the shot clock not working at the start of the second half, the main story would come late. With the time winding down, Al Horford would hit a clutch shot against Pierce and let him hear about it, prompting Pierce to walk over toward the Atlanta bench, jawing and flashing hand gestures before being yanked back. This led to Pierce being fined for 25000 because the league thought it was a menacing gesture, or in other words, gang related. But Pierce stated he 100% does not promote gang violence or anything close to it while Celtics boss Danny Ainge said the gesture represented blood, sweat, and tears. All in all, Game 3 had the Hawks winning 102-93, to which stunned the basketball world. Game 4 featured more beef as a scuffle between Kevin Garnett and Zaza Pachulia took place, but no punches were thrown. Josh Smith hosted his own block party as he broke the Hawks' franchise record with 7 blocks in a game and an offensive takeover by Iso Joe had him exploding for 35 points, including going 7 for 10 in the final quarter. What prompted the historic night for Joe Johnson was due to the fact the Celtics were trapping on the pick and roll. Johnson noticed this, then gave a suggestion to his coach Mike Woodson and asked him to space the floor and let him go to work. It was a major success. It was clear in both losses for the Celtics that the Hawks dictated the pace played an up-tempo style of play by leaking out on fast breaks and they increased their defensive intensity and the crowd was also a significant factor as well. So back to TD Garden it was for game 5, but this time with more of a state of shock from the Celtics, but in the end it would feature another Celtics beatdown on the Hawks as they won by 25. It was Ray Allen who ignited the charge in this one, going 5 for 8 from deep as he nailed three three-pointers in a three-minute span in the third. They also got a huge help from their bench, mainly from Cassell and Powell. And Pierce would finally hit 20 points for the first time in the series. Game 6 would feature the largest crowd ever to be put on display at a Hawks game. Pierce started off aggressive out of the gate, but would eventually foul out near the end of the game. This would be crucial as the defining moment came late with a minute left. Joe Johnson would hit an extremely tough three-pointer to put the Hawks up five. Now with Pierce out of the game, with a few seconds left down by three, the Celtics had one more shot at tying the game, but it resulted in Rondo chucking up an air ball three. However, with all that being said, the stat of the night was the free throws. The Celtics went to the line 25 times, while the Hawks went to the line 47 times. And in the series up to game six, the Hawks went to the free throw line 71 more times than the Celtics. At the end of the game, the streamers fell down from the rafters and Zaza Pachulia grabbed the mic and emphatically voiced his excitement with his team. Not the world, I call it destiny. Zaza, talk about pulling it all in at the end there. Nothing easy, nothing easy. We're going to game seven, baby. Game seven, game seven. But Pachulia and the Hawks' excitement wouldn't last very long, as Game 7 was a complete annihilation of the Atlanta Hawks, with the Celtics winning by 34 points. No game was ever close at the Garden in the series, so this game wasn't out of the ordinary. The same physicality existed in this game as well, as Marvin Williams was ejected for a foul on Rondo. He later apologized, and Kevin Garnett set a vicious screen on Pachulia, which turned into a little scuffle. But this was one of the most surprising series I've ever witnessed. It certainly was a big test for the Celtics, 
and one they possibly needed. As the Celtics advanced, they would defeat the Cavs in 7, the Pistons in 6, and the Lakers in 6 games to earn their 17th franchise title. But it's unbelievable how a team with almost zero playoff experience and 29 less wins gave the team with three Hall of Famers a run for their money. What was it exactly that led to this? Maybe it was the physicality and beef throughout the series that sidetracked the Celtics? Or maybe it was the Hawks' aggressiveness, fast break play, nothing to lose mentality, and intense crowd that pushed the Celtics to play the Hawks' game. I'm personally going with the latter. But something like this makes you question the team's ability. Like is the team that wins the championship actually as great as we think they are? Or did they just run into favorable matchups? We can't really obtain an answer for that. That would require a great deal of hypothetical insight. But if there's one thing for certain, it's this. Nothing is ever promised.